Hello, my name is Mr. G. I'm a spoken word artist. I've been performing poetry for like, wow, the last 20 years. I want to welcome you to Shoreditch, welcome you to Rich Mix, and welcome you to the place that I call home. The thing about new creatives is that we want you to feel at home here. This is your space. We want to encourage the artists within you. You're going to be meeting people from all different types of disciplines, doing all types of amazing artistic careers. This is a place where your journey as an artist can begin. And now I'm going to interview Armani, who is a very talented poet. So Armani, how did you get into poetry? And tell me a bit more about yourself. Sure. So I've been writing page poetry from a really young age. And I guess it's annoying that there's even a distinction, but when I started doing spoken word, that was at university. And so I don't know if you know it, but I went to Exeter University and it's like the whitest little town. You come to London and you hear people talking a lot about like sort of big issues that really matter and like that are just really affecting people and they're deep, you know? And then in Exeter, you have this community of like lovely old men who write poetry about Japanese toilets and fungal cream. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I got my start um, in doing sort of spoken word. It was a good thing because it just meant that I stood out. I got opportunities that were might, might not, I might not have been sort of gotten so easily if I'd been in London where I was one of many brown girls doing a poem. But at the same time, it was dangerous because it was that one brown girl in the village mentality like my voice was spotlighted in a way that made me a representative for an entire community, which, you know, looking back retrospectively, I stand by what I said, but if I'd been, you know, a little more ignorant or, you know, peddling a different narrative, that really would have been caught up in the community at the time. So it must be nice to see, like, your own community reflected in the, in the audience and for them to see you as well. Um, and, then, and then to know that it's possible to, do, to be a poet, to be a, a creative producer and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and like, it's, it's interesting, right? Because representation is important to a point. It's never gonna be the hill I'm gonna die on. But there's, there's something also about having that community space to talk about issues in your own circle. Right? Yeah, a like, safe space. So yeah, exactly. And to be able to kind of hash that out in your own ways, like, and like, so some of the things I'm thinking of particularly are things like anti-blackness and like talking, what does that mean when you're South Asian women, like sort of calling each other out in your own community, that kind of thing. What does femininity and masculinity look like? And how are you gonna talk about that in sort of a South Asian space without sort of an outsider from the community coming in and going, oh yeah, all South Asian women are repressed or oppressed or like put down or submissive. Like it's a place where you can have the messy conversations that you need to have within your own community too. So Armani, what was your highlight at Richwick's? So I ran two of them. And the first one was called Golden Tongue. And that was by and for South Asian women, because when you look at sort of, when you go to a standard poetry night in London, that's not a demographic that you see really often. And it's tough because when you're performing to an audience, you want that audience to connect and resonate with what you're saying, right? You don't want them to exoticize you or fetishize you. And, and that was what I was feeling. And I think what members of my collective at the time, The Universe, which was all about South Asian women, was feeling too. And so we wanted to create that space where you could go and you could perform and you could just be heard for, you know, and, and understood and not have to explain away anything that you were saying. And then that sort of, we ran that for a year monthly at Rich Mix. And the first night that we ran sold out, which was, thank you. And it was, it was really, really magical because we didn't realize that there was such an appetite for that kind of space. And so Rich Mix really gave a home to that. And we were really, really grateful for it. What advice would you give to young people who kind of want to be poets or want to get into events? Do what you love and the money will follow. And I say that because I think like in the UK specifically, what I see, especially with young people, and it's just kind of how education looks here, is that you're set up from a very young age to think about your career trajectory. And the thing is like, as soon as you, people are like, oh, careers and artists, people are like, with what money? You know, you must be, have to be so talented. It's just, that's a sham. If you do what you love, and if you pursue that with passion, you put in the hours and you put in the work, you will become good at it and everything else will form around you. And I guess the other thing is not to follow the preset path. 
because there are so many ways to become an artist, right? There are a thousand paths toward that. And when I think of sort of the spoken word scene, the kind of path at the minute is you go and you do like a collective from a young age and then you go and do the whole open mic circuit and then you get booked and you feature on those. Then maybe you do like a one person show, you put out a pamphlet with a small press yeah. and then it's just like, it's really cookie cutter and that's really boring. Yeah. And there's so many other things you could do. Like if a one man show is not your vibe, do something else, you know, but do what you love and don't follow the preset, I think are my two pieces of advice. Thank you, Armani. It was lovely speaking to you. And again, I really loved your poem. It was really nice. Um, oh yeah, thank you. There must be some Bedouin blood in me because I'm a nomad. I travel these sands alone. My footprints crisscrossing the globe, home in my backpack, adapting wherever I go. Bits of language, currency on my tongue, which is so accented, it's lost in origin. I speak Spanish more fluently than my mother tongue. Found my soul in a flamenco bar in Granada and beauty in the monobrow of Frida Kahlo. Yet my origins are sold back to me in Topshop Banjari bag knockoffs. So I'm the trustee for a charity called Drake Music. We were based roughly about there, I think. Uh, and they're a music and disability charity. Um, so, so I'm disabled myself, I'm a musician. Um, so it's just really nice to actually work with a charity where that is their reason for being. It's about the idea that art should be for everybody and that the world should be accommodating to people rather than always saying that, you know, you have to do, you have to act in certain ways we want um, I mean, they invent new, they in, literally invent new instruments. So rather than being like, you have to play a violin or a flute or a guitar or whatever, they've, they've, the amount of instruments they've built from scratch to accommodate different disabilities is, is incredible. So Cameron, what does creativity mean to you? I think there's a really high bar on like, if you are interested in the creative arts, that you have to have a career in that. And, you know, I think what I've learned is that there's a lot of skills and ways of thinking that you can build up from experience in the creative arts that then actually go really nicely into like other career paths and actually that sort of flexibility. And do you think um, Rich Mix or more specifically the new creatives program, do you think that helped you lead to where you are now? I think what I love about Rich Mix and continue to love is it's easy to say you'll do stuff for young people. It's easy to say you care about what young people do. But Rich Mix gave us this space for a night. They gave the other group a space for a night. Like, yeah. they actually took a risk on us. They actually, you know, put their money where their mouth is and said, "Look, we we believe in you. We we trust that you can do something with this space." And that's what was exciting about it. And so I, 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 I it's no exaggeration to say actually putting on that event really was a. A pivotal moment. The amount of the amount of experience I developed uh, in putting that together, in working with different artists and getting them on board, negotiating with people, uh, negotiating with Rich Mix, getting stuff like health and safety stuff sorted. Again, it's that stuff. That's the sort of stuff that you can take into other career paths, and then it's it. You know, someone's given me that responsibility and allowed me to 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 build things up. If it hadn't been for doing that program at that time, I don't think I would have done half the stuff that's that's come off it since then. Oh, that's incredible. Oh. Um, so another question is, what advice would you give to uh, up and coming poets or young people that are aspiring to be poets? Yeah. Um, what is your thing that you want that is driving you on a day to day basis um, and try and pick up inspiration from everywhere? Because I think if you if you just write and don't take stuff in, you get to a point where you run out of stuff to write about um, and it's not because there's not stuff in there it's just because something's just not sparked it and you can take inspiration from like all different places and I think the more you sort of expose yourself to that the better chance there is that something's actually just going to go oh you've got this huge idea but I think if you funnel yourself and say I'm only going to write poetry about you know me my friends what I know and that's like a, a great place to start 
but just try and take a step back and be like you can write poetry about anything like it's about your relationship to language and what you're trying to convey to an audience so like that's you know i'd say just really think about those things um and think about what excites you and what do you want to put into the world that isn't there so being true to yourself but also taking inspiration from others thank you for answering my questions and yeah great to see you again Tenderness comes when the skin starts to love itself. Tenderness comes when the scars start to heal. Tenderness comes when one learns that tenderness comes to us naturally, if it's allowed. Tenderness comes to us when we least expect it, but tenderness comes with a cost. Now I'm going to be interviewing Naimul, who, who is the uh, former uh, young mayor of the Hamlet and director of Wapping FC. Hello Naimul, how are you? Thanks, very, very happy to have you. So uh, what inspired you to become the former young mayor of the Hamlet? Uh, my journey started at the age of 13. Um, I, I was a pretty troublesome young person um, in the days. I um, used to attend my local youth centre. And my youth workers kind of saw potential in me at the age of 13 and they kind of got me to volunteer and to try out different things. So at 13, I was part of the Youth Opportunity Fund panel where we were giving away grants of up to half a million pounds to youth projects. And kind of being in that capacity, in, in that circumstance and in, in that position, allowed me to see the different projects that were going on. So I then really decided I actually enjoyed seeing the different projects that are going on, seeing young people prosper. At 14, I went on to become one of the founding members of the Tower Hamlet Youth Council. And I realized I was making you know, decisions and ch making changes on a smaller scale. And I thought, okay, I want to do this on a larger scale right now. Um, so again, at 15, I got elected as the young mayor. And why? Simply, I wanted to make a change. I realized, you know, there's no point sitting down and complaining about a change. We should go out, get off our seats and make the change ourselves. So that, for me, was a chance for me to actually get myself on a platform and go out there and represent our young people. Yeah, and any, for any of the young people listening, what are some advice if they do want to apply and they want to be a, kind of a youth mayor? Advice is you've got to be passionate about your community. You know, there's no point in applying for the sake of it. There are people sometimes you see that apply um, for the wrong reasons. I'm not going to say the reasons, but there's so many different wrong reasons. But if you want to apply, yeah, fame or get your picture out there, get your face out there or for the girls or the boys. I don't know. People do that genuinely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you want to apply for it, understand why you want to apply for it. Have a vision in place. For me, when I was young, one of my dreams has always been to be the Chancellor of the Exchequer. If I get there, I don't know if I get close to it. That's amazing. But... That's one of, my, one of my dreams. So I thought, okay, politics is my dream. Being a young mayor is definitely the first step into it. Um, and even since then, the networks I've made, like the mayors, the councillors, um, you know, I've created a friendship with them. You know, even till this day, 10, 15 years down the line, you know, um, people are still messaging me. I'm, I'm in contact with a lot of councillors, a lot of the mayors. Um, you know, there's been times the mayors come to my house for a cup of tea. Um, so those kind of things are nice um, to have that kind of almost like royalty almost within the borough. And what would you say for like advice for young people? How do young people like tackle those barriers and kind of, yeah, help themselves be taken seriously in those big meetings or with those, you know, older people and people that are in uh, that are established in their career? I think one of the things that helped me get through things was having mentors, having coaches. You know, even I'm, I'm 25 right now and I've got coaches from different corporate companies, from 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 politics, um, I've got politicians that are supporting me as well. So no matter how old you are, how young you are, never too young or too old to have mentors. Um, these are mentors that can push you through stuff. You know, there's a lot of times where people come to me, I, I feel like I act as a mentor to at least 10, 15 people right now, and I support them. But again, I don't know everything. Sometimes I don't know anything. I would go away and support, get, get, I mean, get support from my mentor. So to get through these things, you know, get help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You can't do anything alone. You know, partnership is the key, honestly. Like, I've realized that, like, recently I've partnered with so many different organizations where I'm getting funding, sponsorships from so many different places. And if you are open to partnerships, you know, the scope, of, and the way you can scale your business up is honestly unbelievable. So be, don't be afraid to work with people. You can't do it alone. A lot of times people are like, yes, there's a percentage, maybe 0.1% of people that would actually go out there and build a business empire by themselves. Um, but it's very hard. You know, don't think, you know, I'm amazing, I'm gonna do it by myself. Feel free to open your arms and get other people on board. And uh, another question I had to you is, how do you use creativity in your day-to-day -day, uh, job? Uh, for me, creativity is key. You know, every market or industry that you're in, um, it's always developing, it's always forever growing. So how can you keep up? It's about being innovative and creative, right? So give you an example, football world. 
You know, football and creativity, there's not much you can do, um, but we found a way. You know, over lockdown, we decided to partner up with a big um, company, a big brand actually, which I can't name because the kind of process is currently um, going through. Congratulations. Thank, thank you very much. So that brand, where I have agreed to basically say to us every three months, they're going to let our young people design their own football kit and they're going to actually go and make it for us. Right. So for me, that in itself is creativity because we're getting young people to kind of create their own football kit. So creativity comes into any industry, you know, any any sector. You just got to find the right way to utilize it. So for me in football, that's the most recent example I can give you. But there are ways where, you know, recently, you know, we tried to tackle mental health. We de delivered online art competitions. Um, recently, we did a mural in Wapping um, celebrating the NHS. I know Rich Mix had a bigger one than us, uh, which is amazing to see. Uh, and again, it's just, you know, ways you can involve the community, you know. Um, I think the creative kind of aspect needs to be in every sort of industry, every sort of social enterprise, um, and, and you've got to find the right way to utilise it. Hello, Amber, how are you today? I'm well, thank you, how are you? Thank you. So I just wanted to ask you a bit about uh, who you are, what you do, yeah. Yeah, well I'm a, I combine a few different things, but I'm mostly um, an arts producer, but I'm also a writer. So I write uh, non-fiction and I published my first book uh, in 2018 and I'm working on my second one at the moment. Congratulations. Yeah. So um, what do you think uh, about art and how important it is in the means of resistance? Well, this is exactly what my new book is all about. So it's um, looking at arts as a means of resistance. And I kind of, I guess I've worked in the arts and been involved in arts in different ways since I was a teenager, especially as sort of politics have felt quite volatile and there's been a lot of division sort of with Brexit and things like that. I really wanted to go, OK, I've got this assumption that it matters and it can make a political difference, but I kind of want to be able to prove that. And I want to go and kind of look back in history and find stories of when it has. So I've kind of done this big journey, I guess, over the last sort of 18 months where I've been researching loads and loads of stories about artists who've kind of been in really politically challenging situations and have taken the arts and done something really, really powerful with it and like made genuine change. And it's been so inspiring. I mean, so I got to go to um, Jersey in January this year. I was there for three months and I was learning about this amazing artist called um, <clears throat> Claude Cahoon, who was kind of an amazing genderqueer, lesbian, surrealist artist who ended up living in Jersey during the Second World War and it was occupied by the Nazis and she kind of staged her own underground resistance there by like creating all these pamphlets she was like putting in the soldiers' pockets and all these kind of things. And in terms of Rich Mix, um, what, do you love so, what do you love about Rich Mix and how that kind of ties in with who you are and resistance and art and stuff like that and being a producer? Well, I've kind of been to Rich Mix, coming to Rich Mix as an audience member for at least a decade, I think. And I've seen so many different things and loads of what I've seen has been from different parts of the world. So just that kind of diversity of experiences and perspectives all being in one place, I think is amazing. Um, I also this year with my sort of theatre producer hat on as opposed to writing producing, writing, um, I work with an artist in Palestine called uh, Riham Isaac and we kind of made a work in progress piece that we um, kind of presented here in March this year. So she came over from Palestine, we had like six weeks to develop this piece which is all about kind of love and romance in different cultures and kind of what what I suppose transcends different cultures in our, our attitudes to these things and I just don't think I probably would have seen that kind of work anywhere else. There's not many other places in London that kind of has that. Such a diverse yeah. array of... Yeah, so that was really great. Do you have any advice for um, aspiring producers or writers? A key ingredient to success is kind of failure and rejection. And I don't think you realise that when you're starting out, that the people who are really successful, unless they're like incredibly like lucky, have had loads and loads of rejection along the way and probably even more so than those who aren't successful. Because if you kind of have your first rejection and you think, 
oh, that's it, you know, I'm not cut out for this world. You'll very quickly fall by the wayside. Do you think um, anyone can be a writer? Yeah, definitely. And I really try and get away from a lot of what you get told in school is you have to be, you know, know all the long words and like have read every book. And I really don't think that's the case. You almost can become less sort of accessible and it, it might become harder to connect with people if you're sort of attached to kind of really long words and things like that so yeah I'm really passionate about the idea that everyone can be a writer and it might not necessarily even be you want to go out and write books but actually the skill of kind of knowing how to sort of tell your own story and kind of put it into words in a compelling way and kind of understand your own narrative of your own life all those things are so valuable in so many different situations so you know you might come along and think I, you know, I really want to write, be a writer. I want to write a book. Fantastic. But even if it's just about, do you know what? I just really want to understand how to kind of frame my own story and my own experiences. That's really exciting as well. Awesome. So thank you very much, Amber, for speaking with us and uh, look forward to seeing you at the uh, workshops. Yeah, I can't wait. Thank you. And now we're going to be talking to Mikey, who is the founder and creator of The People Speak. Hello, Mikey. How are you today? Very good. Yourself? I'm very well, thank you. So do you want to tell me a bit more about The People Speak? Yeah, my name's Mikey Winecove. I'm one of the senior partners of The People Speak. We're an international arts collective that's based in East London with all different kinds of skills. And we do that through Things like Talkioki, our pop-up talk show, um, The Slice is Right, which is pizza making under different political conditions. Um, Segway, which is a generative instant film factory production line. And lots of other things like that. The thing is, like that incident there, I don't know if that, did that make you feel more safe because the police arrived or did it make you feel less safe because you saw this massive violence happening in the park? Yeah. It probably just left school. Yeah. Probably not done so well in the GCSEs and it probably a little bit lost. Yeah, yeah. There was one fella called Diogenes and it was yeah. labelled, <laughs> it was labelled Diogenes the Cynic. About Diogenes. Yeah. Yeah. And essentially he refused uh, everything social and yeah. he, he was the but He wasn't working he, in the he was, was he? No, he was the pinnacle of Greece culture. Well, like being different thing is like you can do little things to be different in like that kind of aspect of it. Right. It's not about like the big things like dyeing your hair and getting tattoos and piercings and stuff. You can just do like little small things. That... What I've seen of those who went to segregated schools are much worse at interacting with other females. Um, struggle. I, I feel that they have a more aggressive masculine man and so do you think art can be like can be uh can facilitate change um, i think art is essential for facilitating change i think um you know it was said recently on one of our talkiokis that politics is all about ideas and art and creativity is all about generating new ideas and generating new perspectives so the two are very much tied together um, you just can't have one without the other. No, you can't. And so what inspired you to come up with the talk show? Was it like we were just talking about, you know, inspiring change, facilitating change? or That was part of it. I mean, a lot of it was about frustration with television media because this was before social media and all of that stuff. I was getting very frustrated with TV talk shows where the conversation was so staged and scripted and there was no room for people to listen to each other and to actually develop their ideas. So it was more like people that had different political views just shouting at each other and not really listening. So I was like, how do we actually create a, a vessel for conversation where you can have a bit of movement, some dynamism, where people actually listen to each other and actually change their views based on what other people say? So I started off with this idea, let's have a talk show, but without a subject and just see where it goes. And that was already kind of interesting, but it was only when we got this kind of structure of the round table where it made sense, it looked like a TV talk show and people were kind of close to each other that it just kind of kicked off. It was only supposed to be a one-off experiment. That was 23 years ago and we've done more than a thousand talk shows since then. Lovely, and so what advice would you give to 
kind of up and coming artists that want to do things like a podcast or a talk show and they want to be different and come and you know and they have fresh ideas what advice would you give them i would say just get just hit record do it straight away make something do it again make it better show it to people talk to people um, just keep going with it. That would be my advice to any young creative is just get on and start making stuff because actually that relationship between making and putting it out there in the world is actually the essence of what creativity is. All right then, thank you so much for talking with us, Mikey. And uh, it was lovely. My pleasure. I hope you've had a taste of what New Creatives is all about. We are based here in Bethnal Green Road, so come in, the door is open, uh, and we're looking forward to have you on New Creatives programme. Yeah, always remember, be yourself, have fun, trust in the process, trust in your creativity, and our doors are always open, come and have a chat with us. See you soon. Bye. I think there's also an element of like understanding yourself before anyone else can. Okay, so you've got to understand yourself before you can understand yeah. others. Because like, there's one thing like arguing against, like, say someone says something about a certain opinion, but you don't know your own opinion, you can't really critique their opinion. Okay, who all right. Can, who, who, though, can say around this table, you understand each other, you, you understand yourself?